Hi, nice to see you all again. Uh, I had a lot of fun joining you for the marathon the other weekend. And here I'm talking to you about chapters 19 through 24 of David Copperfield. So there are two big moments I want to focus on. And the first one, the preparation for it, is uh, in the scene where David visits uh, the Steerforth family in chapter 20. And Steerforth calls uh, the Pegatees after having met Ham and his father, or his uncle, um, that sort of people. And he explains on page 303 why there's a pretty wide separation between them and us, said Steerforth with indifference. They are not to be expected to be as sensitive as we are. Their delicacy is not to be shocked or hurt very easily. They are wonderfully virtuous, I dare say. Some people contend for that, at least. And I am sure I don't want to contradict them, but they have not very fine natures. And they may be thankful that, like their coarse, rough skins, they are not easily wounded. Really, said Mrs. Dartle. Miss Dartle. Well, I don't know now when I've been better pleased than to hear that. It's so consoling. It's such a delight to know that when they suffer, they don't feel. Sometimes I've been quite uneasy for that sort of people, but now I shall just dismiss the idea of them altogether, live and learn. I had my doubts, I confess, but now they are cleared up. I didn't know, and now I do know, and that shows the advantage of asking, don't it? So one of the wonderful things about Miss Startle is her ability to uh, point out the sort of hypocrisy or inadequacy of the things that Steerforth in particular thinks about the world, particularly things he does, including things he's done to her. Um, and this is a moment at which Steerforth, despite the sort of uh, David's rose-colored glasses and the way that he looks at Steerforth, uh, the novel is trying to help us recognize the problem in terms of the way Steerforth sees the world. Now, when, Dave, when Steerforth calls them that other sort of people, he's really talking about um, the Pegades as if they're almost another class of beings. Um, he's talking about officially sort of class, like the difference between those with wealth and those who do not have wealth, the gentle folk and the populace. But in the 19th century imagination, for some anyway, it was almost like a distinction between entire peoples, entire races. As a matter of fact, there was a belief that um, as they came to understand the history of the colonization of Britain itself, right, the relationship between the Angles and the Saxons and the uh, Celts before them, that you could even find in these class differences, these sort of essential racial differences between people. So in other words, class distinction in the way that somebody like Steerforth talks about it is almost like racism today. And Mrs. Miss Dartle is really pointing that out here and pointing out the absurdity of saying there are people who really don't feel pain. Um, okay, so we fast forward just a little bit from that scene until the moment when um, David is uh, having a conversation with Steerforth and inviting him to come visit uh, the Peggotty family. And here Steerforth is sort of calls back to this previous conversation on page 310. David says, uh, why, I was thinking that this evening would be a good time to meet them. Steerforth, when they're all sitting around the fire, I should like to see it when it's snug. It's such a curious place. So be it, returns Steerforth, this evening. I shall not give them any notice that we're here, you know, said I, delighted. We must take them by surprise. Oh, of course, it's no fun, said Steerforth, unless we take them by surprise. Let us see the natives in their aboriginal condition. Though they are that sort of people that you mentioned, I returned. Ah, what, you recollect my skirmishes with Rosa, do you? He exclaimed with a quick look. Confound the girl, I'm half afraid of her. She's like a goblin to me, but never mind her. So this is a moment at which Steerforth is again treating uh, the Peggotty family is if they're another class of beings. He's acting like he's some sort of like conquering um, investigator, like some uh, white um, ethnographer who's penetrating uh, some other space of people, and he's going to study them. And he says, natives in their aboriginal conditions, deeply racist language, but it's ra language is cast through a very particular kind of language. Um, it's the language of sort of uh, contemporary racial science, or what we would call today anthropology. Now, the reason I want to talk about this really briefly is in any novel, 
there are opportunities for the novel to recast what's going on through the language of some other field, right? Um, in literary scholarship, we call this discourse. It, it picks a discourse, a way of talking, from another mode of understanding and applies it to the problem at hand. Here, when you invoke something like 19th century um, anthropology, which was deeply racist in a lot of its assumptions, it gives the novel an opportunity to focus us on the problem of the way that people see things through the lens of the flaws in contemporary um, anthropological science, right? In other words, by invoking this discourse, this language, it's like putting on a set of glasses that are distorted for one moment just so you can see what's wrong about looking at people a certain way. It sort of highlights, dramatizes the basic problem in the way that Steerforth understands other people, particularly people from another class. And the nice thing about this moment is not only does David recognize he's doing it, he connects it back to the way Steerforth was talking to Dartle, and he connects it back to the, the point that Miss Dartle made, Rosa, when she highlighted the absurdity of this perspective, these, the quasi-racist, certainly deeply, despicably classist assumptions bound up in this way of thinking. Okay, so from that moment, I want to pass forward to the moment when we, uh, Steerforth actually encounters um, the, the Peggotty family. And this is an important moment because it's going to teach us a lot about Dickens's craft. Okay. So, uh, page 319, um, the narrator says, narrator David, we said no more as we approached the light, but made softly for the door. I laid my hand upon the latch and whispering, steer forth to keep close to me, went in. A murmur of voices had been audible on the outside. and At the moment of our entrance, a clapping of hands, which latter noise I was surprised to see, proceeded from the generally disconsolate Mrs. Gummidge. But Mrs. Gummidge was not the only person there who was unusually excited. Mr. Peggotty, his face lighted up with uncommon satisfaction, and laughing with all his might, held his rough arms open, as if for little Emily to run into them. Ham, with a mixed expression in his face of admiration, exultation, and a lumbering sort of bashfulness that sat upon him very well, held little Emily's hand uh, held Little Emily by the hand, as if he were presenting her to Mr. Peggotty. Little Emily herself, blushing and shy, but delighted with Mr. Peggotty's delight, as her joyous, joyous eyes expressed, was stopped by our entrance, for she saw us first, in the very act of springing from Ham to nestle in Mr. Peggotty's embrace. In the first glimpse we had of them all, and at the moment of our passing from the dark cold night into the warm room, this was the way in which they were all employed. Mrs. Gummidge in the background, clapping her hands like a madwoman. The little picture was so instantaneously dissolved by a going in that one might have doubted whether it had ever been. This moment is enormously important for the novel because the moment at which Steerforth first encounters little Emily. Um, it has all sorts of repercussions later on. But it's also an important moment because it teaches us something crucial about the way that Dickens thinks about what novels do, the way in which his novels interact with other media, and also the way that Dickens incorporated the work of his illustrators into his work. We call this in literary scholarship a tableau vivant. Literally, he is painting the scene with his words as if everybody's frozen together. And he draws this technique from contemporary melodrama. In melodrama, which was a stage genre, in other words, a genre performed in the theater, there were tableau vivant all over the place, right? Tableau vivant in French literally means um, a living picture, right? So what would happen is, at a key moment in the, in the stage, on the stage, in the drama, everything would freeze and lock into position. And everybody on that stage was expressing something that contributed to an analysis of the moment, the state of the society, the state of the family, who everybody was, what they were feeling, where they're going, what their aspirations are, what their losses are. These moments would try to lock all of that in into a temporary picture where all the actors are frozen on stage and allow the audience to decode it, to read it as if they were looking at a painting. Dickens mentions earlier in the novel uh, the joy that David has going to theater to see uh, both a pantomime, which is related to uh, melodrama, and I believe Julius Caesar. But we know that Dickens loved melodramas, and they're 
their influence is all over his fiction. But probably the most important thing that they did for him is to create the opportunity for scenes like this. They allowed him to take the moment to stop in the flow of action and paint a picture with words that tried to articulate something crucial about where everybody was at that moment and what their relationship was between them. And these scenes are incredibly important also because they became the focal point for what his illustrators often had to do. If you turn to the following page, you see this illustration in which um, this, this sort of tableau vivant that Dickens has painted in words is then realized in the actual illustration. And so it shows that intimate relationship that Dickens had with all of his illustrators. But part of that relationship doesn't run just between the novel and the way the paintings are drawn, but between this triangulation between novels, what happens in stage drama, and what illustrators are able to do. And all of them are working in this economy in which people understand that you can decode visual situations like this, and they will tell you something essential about the way the world works. Now, in this particular example, it's important, I think, that David and Steerforth have popped in on this domestic scene, because it is literally the case that David and Steerforth in particular, when they intervene in this domestic situation, will cause ultimately catastrophic effects. It's also important, I think, that it's a scene that's essentially about social cohesion, everybody coming together, little Emily in particular, moving from Ham to Mr. Peggotty. But when Emily sees them, she stops. It arrests her motion. In other words, it rips her out to some degree of her intimate coordination with the others in this domestic environment. She stopped. And, and one thing that you have to wonder is why, right? Why is it that she stopped mid-motion? What is it about the presence of David and Steerforth that prevents her from being integrated into this world in some basic way? So it's an incredibly important moment for all sorts of reasons, for what it means for the novel, but it can tell you so much about Dickens's art and how he understands what words can do and what words can do to create a picture in our minds that then we can use to understand the world around us. So I hope those two scenes help. Keep them in mind as you move forward in the novel. Uh, there's so much more in these chapters that I could talk about, but I just want to focus on a couple key moments. And again, it was such a pleasure to join you the other weekend, and I look forward to working with you over the course of this semester as we explore David Copperfield. Thanks. Bye.